It's time for our first round table, so this will be moderated by Louis Cooper, who is financial columnist at The, the Times. Uh, and I would like to invite back uh, David Smith um, and uh, also, as I said, Paul Ollingsworth and John Wheeler um, to join for this round table, uh, which will conclude around 10.55, 11 o'clock. Thank you, Louise. Hello to you all out there. We'll just let the guys... We're missing... Where's John? Oh, here he is. <laughs> uh, right, we've heard from um, uh, Julian and David, so I thought we'd give uh, our other two panellists time, just a couple of minutes each, to tell us what they think of the world. And we will start with Paul uh, um, Hollingsworth from Capital Economics. What did you make of what we've heard, and what are your thoughts about the UK and the global economy? Yes, yeah, so I think I'll probably comment mostly on the UK, as I'm a UK economist at Capital Economics, so that's more my, my area of expertise. Um, Thank you, David, for your presentation. I thought it was really good, and I actually agree with most of what you said. Um, there were three questions in particular. The first was that, is the recent slowdown evidence of a fading recovery? The second being, uh, is the next move in interest rates up or down? And uh, the third being, will the UK remain in the EU, and, and if so, I'm sorry, um, will the UK leave the EU, and if so, what, what the impact would be? And so I thought I'd just comment very briefly on how I um, saw those, uh, those, those three points. I think the first question, the slowdown that we are seeing at the moment is clearly about more than just uh, a Brexit. After all, the slowdown's been occurring for quite some time now, and Brexit fears have only really sort of picked up since around the start of this year. And also there are other sectors in the economy, um, things like retail spending, and you've seen slowdown uh, occur there as well. And that's not areas where there's obviously going to be a sort of Brexit, uh, a Brexit fear. And it's quite easy to paint a more worrying narrative, and that is that the temporary stimulus that we've seen, um, low interest rates, uh, low energy prices over, over the past year or so, uh, are now starting to fade and exposing some, some cracks in the recovery. Uh, and also we're now seeing austerity ramp up as well. But I think there is still some reason to be relatively hopeful. So we saw growth in the first quarter of this year pretty disappointing, only 0.4% uh, quarter on quarter. But there could be some other temporary factors at play there as well, uh, such as the financial market turmoil that we did see at the start of the year, and that perhaps weighed on growth uh, a bit as well. So I think the fact that it isn't entirely Brexit-related means it's clearly that, that lessens the scope for a post-referendum rebound. But I do think that activity will still strengthen um, in the second half of this year, assuming that the UK does uh, vote to remain in. But in the more medium term, clearly productivity is, is the key issue. And I think most people have started to become more pessimistic on productivity now. And certainly the, um, the Bank of England and the Office of Budget Responsibility have all sort of downgraded their, their expectations for, for productivity growth in future. But I do think there is, again, a few reasons to be, to be optimistic. Um, the first is that if we look at the gap between the level of productivity in the UK and the US, that's absolutely enormous, and there's no good reason to think that the UK was, uh, that suffered so much worse than, than the US um, during the recent crisis, or certainly took as, as permanent hit to, to, to productivity. I think the second is that if we look at the, the industry breakdown, so David showed that chart with the, the, the fastest growing and the slowest growing um, areas of productivity at the moment. I think what's important is to actually look at where productivity is now relative to where it would have been if productivity in the sectors have continued to grow at, at the pre-crisis trend. And actually, if we look at that, we see that it, it's a fairly broad-based uh, weakness in, in productivity, not confined to just, just a few sectors. And so there are plenty of sectors where there's good reason to think that productivity hasn't been permanently damaged. And perhaps as demand continues to strengthen, uh, we should hopefully see, see a pickup. I think the third reason to be optimistic on productivity is that we need to just look back in history. You know, every recovery since, since the post-war period has seen a pretty strong recovery in productivity uh, as well. It could just be that this time round it's taking uh, even longer to come about. Now, the second point was on interest rates, and um, I agree with David that I think markets certainly have gone too far in expecting no rate rise until around 2020. Uh, most economists think that still maybe Q4 this year or the first quarter of next year, we might see, see the first rise in interest rates, uh, assuming a vote to remain. 
but clearly a lot depends uh, on Brexit, and, and that would certainly uh, change, change the outcome. Now, on Brexit, I also agree that we probably will vote to stay in, although I think it will be quite close, and clearly turnout uh, will be key. Now, in the short term, we agree that there would be a hit to the economy, and I think that is generally the, the, the consensus among most economists. Um, for what it's worth, we think that the hit would be about 1% to 2% of GDP after a few years. Now, that doesn't mean it's an outright recession. That just means that we'd see a period of slower growth over those first few years um, while there was a lot of uncertainty about the, the future relationship between the UK and the EU. But I think we are a little bit more optimistic about the, the medium-term outlook. Uh, and we think that the UK would probably, in the long run, do, do well whether it was inside or outside the EU. And arguably, this productivity question could end up being even, even more significant. You know, if we were to regain all of that lost ground during the crisis uh, in productivity, then that would offset even the most pessimistic assumptions about the, uh, the impact of a Brexit on the economy. Paul, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I don't know if you remember, David. Um, we were on Radio 4's PM um, together discussion, I can't remember what it was about the economy, but we were discussing the economy, and I was um, talking about inflation through the medium of shoes. Um, I'm sure many of you will know that women, some women like shoes, and I'm one of them, and, um, and you teased me, David, and you said um, that you don't live on planet shoe, uh, you live in the real world. Do you remember this, David? I, I, I would never have been so rude. So, uh, anyway, uh, I don't, no. so we're not going to go to Planet Shoe. We're going to go to Planet Office Depot now. We've heard from the, th the three theoretical economists, so let's hear from the coalface, Planet Shoe or Planet Office Depot. John Wheeler, Director of Credit and Collections at Office Depot. You've heard all the theory. Um, what do you see um, in the European, global, UK economy? What, what do you think, where, where do you think where we are? Um, it feels a bit like we're in a bit of an industrial inertia or capex inertia. Um, and one of the ways we, we judge it is the number of furniture projects that we have across Europe. Um, and we've seen spend very flat. Um, generally, when, when people are expanding, they buy more furniture, they take on new premises. And that's one of the bellwethers that, that we have for this state of the economy around Europe. Um, and, you, and you're not seeing that increasing? We're not seeing that. It's kind of a capex inertia or people are holding to see what happens. It's kind of treading water rather than saying, right, well, let, let's go for it. The signs are generally good. Um, so, so generally, I'd say there's, there's cautiousness across Europe. UK is, is probably stronger than most, um, but obviously Brexit is now a, a big feature. Uh, so people just want it to be over now and, and, and move forward. Um, but I would say growth is, is very difficult. Our customers, and, and we trade with um, every industry pretty much. Everybody buys office mm. supplies. Um, Are there any particular industries that are doing well or poorly? Can you see much differentiation between them? Um, not particularly. I think they're all in the same situation. Um, there's, there's smaller businesses tend to be doing a bit better because they, they will make decisions and, and grasp opportunities. Bigger organisations are very focused on, on cost control. Um, looking to reduce their costs as much as they can. That impacts us because they, they recruit less people, they need less office supplies. Um, everything is around price. Um, so operating costs is, is a big concern for the customers that, that, that I speak to. Um, well, I thought we'd, we'd do, we'd sort of have a little bit of a discussion on the UK global European economy, and then we'll move on to the referendum on the 23rd of June, because I'm sure you will have uh, strong views on that. Um, I also, I, not only do I write for papers, but I present on uh, Wake Up to Money on Five Live, I present on Radio 4, and of course this week has been a great week for business journalists, because of course we've had uh, Dominic Chappelle here in front of the Select Committee yesterday on BHS, uh, we've had Mike Ashley, Sports Direct, uh, the day before. Um, have any of you watched any of it? Any of you watching it? Great, a compulsive viewing, frankly it's been better television than the Game of Thrones without the sex and nudity, for which we should all be profoundly grateful. Uh, the thought of Mike Ashley in the buff um, <laughs> does quite poor things to me. Anyway, there, there have been other business stories out there this week, um, particularly on low interest rates. So if you drag your eyes away from Mike Ashley or Dominic Chappelle, um, two things this week. 
Uh, the German government has borrowed money at record low interest rates. So the German government can now borrow 10-year money lower than 0.5% a year. So if you want to lend, you want to give money to the German government, they will give you just well, it's about 0.0495% a year. That's a record low for a German Bund yield. Look at the UK government, issued 30-year debt this week, 30-year guilt. Now, in 30 years' time, I know you won't believe it, but I will be 76. Now, would I give the UK government 30-year money if they were going to pay me just 2%, just over 2% a year, given our inflationary record? Probably not. LVMH, according to the Financial Times today, French luxury goods company, uh, some of its debt is now yielding negative interest rates. So you give them 100 euros and they give you 99 back or whatever it is at the end of the, of the time period. If you believe these markets, what they are saying is that inflation, and therefore interest rates, will be pretty close to zero for not just a year or two, but for years, if not decades. The whole point of QE and low interest rates is it was supposed to, all the theoretical economists would tell you here, it would create inflation. Well, actually, we've got the opposite. So I was going to ask you again, um, John, Office Depot, Office Depot, we haven't quite decided how we we're going to pronounce it, but Office Depot, um, sources all over the world, big sources in China, sells all over the world. Where are you on this whole inflation-deflation debate? Um, I, I agree. I think uh, most people aren't expecting to see price rises um, in the near future. Um, are think, you seeing price cuts? Um, we are in, in some areas, not universally. Um, it is a very competitive in industry that we operate. Um, we, we can save cost on our sourcing through the, through the scale of our procurement which is why we source um, globally. Um, so we are able to get some price reductions, and we're under a huge pressure from our customer base to keep prices coming down. Can I stop you there? So I, I thought I'd have a little audience interaction. You speak to businesses. You are a business. And I like to answer this because it's been quite interesting, some of the answers I've got at conferences. Thinking of your businesses and businesses you know well, how many of them do you think can put their prices up how many do you think are forced to cut prices, or how many are prices flat? So think about it, and I'm going to ask you to put your hands up. So how many of you think that, on average, the businesses you know well can put prices up? That's one hand, OK? How? Oh, was there two? Yeah. Do you know what? I, OK, I, clearly I need my glasses on. Right, so two hands. How many of you? Do you think the businesses you know are forced to cut prices? That's definitely more than two. That's more than two. I can't quite add you all up, but I would roughly guess it's about 20%. How many are prices flat? Perfect. I said another 20%. Clearly, there's a, like the EU referendum, clearly there's lots of undecideds. Um, so does that surprise you, John? Um. Not particularly, because I, I see the, the pressure on uh, competitiveness is, is increasing. Um, customers I speak to are under huge pressure, so they're, they're reluctant to increase prices. I think at best, prices are, are held flat, um, and in some cases, they have to be cut because of, of increasing competition. So we have to cut our prices in certain, certain sectors uh, to remain competitive. Well, I think we have some roving mics. Do we? Yes, we have roving mics. So now is the chance to ask our panel of experts whatever you want to ask them. So if you'd like to put your hands up, you must have some questions. Oh, here we go. There's one at the front here. Oh, God. We, were going to, we were going to keep that for later. Do you have another question? Uh, Do you have another question? We were, we were going to keep exit for the time being. Has anyone else got any other questions? Can I... Um, go on, of course you can. Can I say something? I, I, you oh, you, there is a question, oh, actually. Yeah. If you get the mic to him, and we'll hear from David. There we go. David? Uh, well, while, while the mic's on the way... I mean, just your point about, um, you know, all these... This, exceptionally, uh, this debt issuance, exceptionally low interest rates. Um, 
I mean, some of it, it just reflects, I think, the fact that we asked, you know, that, that central banks are doing unusual things and people can't see the end of that process, mainly because they can't see beyond the sort of medium term. But I, I remember, you know, when my stepmother died a few years ago and she had all this low coupon government debt and it wasn't worthless, but it wasn't worth a huge amount, you know, because it had been, it, it, you know, it, it had gone through the period of high inflation and so on. It's, I think it's important not to get locked into the view that things stay as they are now forever. You know, I'm not, I'm not predicting that we'll go back to 15% interest rates or, or, or whatever, but this is an, still an abnormal period. And, you know, it's not so long ago in the UK that we wondered whether we'd ever get inflation down to the 2% mm. target. You know, it was in, in, until late 2013, we were still stuck at nearer to 3%, or mm. we've been at 5% and so on. And obviously the oil price has been a big influence on that. So I, I don't think people should suddenly think, well, we're in a zero inflation world forever. I mean, I, you know, that, that, is, that is not the case. You know. And in fact, one could well argue, Julian, yeah. that actually central banks are manipulating the bond market so they don't give a to reflection of, of what the future could hold? No, I think, I think we have to wonder why, why do they do that? They do that because, okay, as everybody, as everybody knows, I mean, inf inflation is low. It's not only low in Europe, it's not only low in the UK, in France, and so on. It's also low in the US, it's low in China, in slow. There are only a few exceptions in the world which are, I mean, basically Brazil, Russia, and, and India, and India, I don't know, but for, for very specific reasons. So. Basically, if you exclude these three countries at the global level, I mean, inflation has never been so low than it is today. And it's very simple. I mean, the reason why inflation is low is when inflation is low in all markets in all countries, it's because supply is higher than demand. And, and supply is higher than demand because it was a huge crisis. So we still have to face with a lot of overcapacities in a lot of sectors and in a lot of countries. So now the question is, how, how do we solve it? And the problem is that the answer is nobody knows. I mean, really, nobody knows. So the only one tool we have is to cut rates, then to buy government bonds, then to buy corporate bonds. Then the last tool is, Japan is doing it at the moment, is to buy stocks. But we don't know if it's going to have a real, an impact on the real economy. So far, it doesn't have any. But it's just we don't know any other tool to do that. We had that question. Can I see? Oh, excellent, excellent, yes. Excellent. What's your question, please, for the panel? If GDP is the measure on, on which an economy uh, is, is good or bad, then what do we have when there is per capita non-productivity? Don't you have to have immigration and immigration at a very large rate so that you can borrow more money to pay your public servants and your public sector? Paul, do you want to? Yeah, clearly, immigration has been one of the reasons that the UK economy over the past few years, at least, has grown so strongly. Like you say, we've had very weak productivity growth, but very strong employment growth. That's the, the flip side of the weak productivity growth. And a large part of that has been due to, to immigration. So certainly, if if productivity continues to, to remain in the doldrums as it has been uh, since the crisis, then, then clearly, yeah, in terms of raising the absolute level of GDP, then immigration would be one of those, one of the ways to do that. But clearly that then puts other pressures on, on public services and things. So that has significant repercussions as well. So that's why I think productivity and getting productivity up will be will be the key to ensuring that GDP growth is sustainable over the medium term. Um, I think that is, uh, is the, big, the big issue. Sorry? With lower immigration, because we don't need to. Yeah. That, that's a, that, yeah. Wouldn't that be the conclusion? If we have, sorry. You were cutting out. David? Yeah, um, it, it's, it's an interesting point. I mean, one, one, one point that I think is sometimes lost in, this, in the debate over immigration is that um, the, the employment rate chart I showed was for, all, for everybody. But if you take the employment rate for UK-born people or UK nationals, 
it's also at record levels. So the, you know, the, although we've seen a big increase in immigration, we've also seen a, a very substantial increase in employment to record levels and a record rate among the UK-born population. So the two things have gone hand in hand. But, but part of the, uh, you know, you, uh, the answer is partly in your question, because if you look at where the demand for uh, migrant labor has been strongest, it's been in the service sector. Some of those activities are almost naturally low productivity activities, you know, coffee shops and things like that. If there's anybody from a coffee shop here, they would deny that. But, you know, so, so, so to a certain extent, you know, the, if you like, the serviceization of the economy, the shift to, to, to greater service sector activities is probably going to be associated with lower productivity growth anyway. And they, you know, the challenge has, has always been when you've got a service-dominated economy, how do you raise productivity in that? And can you achieve the kind of productivity growth rates you had in the past with or without uh, immigration? Oh, yes, of course. We need greater GDP growth in order to borrow more why do we need to borrow more money? We need to actually use it to pay for an increase in our public sector, in particularly all the compliance offices that we now have to have. And in the end, the private sector actually has to pay for that in the long term. And I think a lot of people would object to that. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, compliance and the public sector is a very small part of the reason why uh, we pay taxes. I mean, it's, uh, you know, mm. we, all get, we all get obsessed and upset about red tape and so on, but I, I don't think that's the, a particular <laughs> big element of the story, but uh, it may be in your case. But, yeah. um, there was a question down here. Uh, from Standard Chartered Bank. The question I have is, uh, we were expecting the Feds to cut, I mean, to increase the interest rate, and then suddenly it was put on hold purely because of the lower uh, employment uh, figures that they got, but largely on account of the uncertainty on the break exit uh, to see what's the outcome is. Now, f looking on from a Bank of England interest rate uh, rise, what would be the factors affecting the domestic? Now, it seems to be very clear that any interest rate rises more on domestic as well as on international. So from our own perspective, from Bank of England, what would be the external factors that we would think would have a larger influence, and especially in Asia or, or in, in the latter markets? Julian, Paul? Um, yeah, I mean, just, just to start with the, the, US, the US Federal Reserve, um, it's true that, I mean, a few weeks ago, everybody was expecting a hike on July 15. And then everybody moved to in June, June 15. And then everybody moved to, to July because, because of what you said, because of the, the UK referendum, the Spanish election, and so on. So now it's, it's, a, it's like a deja vu. I mean, over the past years, everybody was, uh, was, was starting to expect hikes in a few weeks and in a few months, and then it's always postponed uh, because, uh, because, of, uh, because of disappointing data. And, and I, think, I think that the momentum is, de is definitely fading in the US, like in the UK, and so the space to hike rates is, uh, is, is definitely not there anymore. So perhaps there will be one hike by the end of the year uh, in the second part of the year, but it's, it's really uncertain, and beyond, and beyond this, uh, I, don't see, I, I don't see much more. And I mean, that's my personal view, but it, I think it's gonna be the same in the UK. Now the momentum is clearly fading, Let's, let's look at the best case scenario where there is, a, there is, a, there is no Brexit after June, June 23. But even in this scenario, as you said, I mean, the UK economy is clearly slowing. So I don't see, I don't see any space for the Bank of England to, to, to hike rates in the coming months. It's quite interesting, because this is a theme that's been with us for quite some time, sluggish growth, lower than expected inflation. In fact, overnight, we've had three developments, and it's all the same thing. We've had the Bank of Korea surprisingly cut rates. Again, central banks all over the world have been cutting rates and they weren't expected to. Why? Sluggish growth, no inflation. We've had Chinese inflation data overnight, which again was weaker than expected. And we've had some Japanese data on, I um, can't remember what it was now, there's some much weaker machinery orders that had fallen 11% month on month. It's the same story, sluggish to non-existent growth, inflation coming in below expectations. I mean, this is, this is the story. 
And, and the Bank of Korea is really a good example because it's a, you, you can make a good comparison with the UK because, okay, you have to look at the momentum of the cycle when, do you, when you decide to hike or to cut rates. But in some countries, you have also to look at what's going on on corporate and household balance sheets. And both in Korea and in the UK, one of the reasons why I think the, the, the Bank of England will be reluctant to hike rates is because, uh, because of household debt. I mean, if you hike rates, you have to also to pay attention for that. All right, we now, it's time for the discussion on the referendum. Um, I thought it'd be quite fun, with your agreement, um, to do a little poll. Um, newspapers pay a fortune for polls, and we can do one for free. So are you willing to put your hands up for an innie or an outy or a don't knowy? Are we happy to do that? Okay, right, let's do then. Okay, I've done this at a couple of conferences and I've got two completely different answers, which I think says a lot about the people at the conferences. Right, so who's an innie? Okay, I reckon, what do you reckon? Is that about 40%, 30%? 40%, 50%? Okay, who's an outy? 25%? Who doesn't know? Now that's interesting. There's only a few of you don't know. So I did a conference about six, six weeks ago and half the audience didn't know. What do you make of that? Now, Paul, you've done, Capital Economics has done a load of research on this about the economic implications of voting in or voting out. Um, summarize that for us if you could. So I guess it depends on whether you're talking about the short term or, or the medium to long run. Um, in the short term, clearly, there would be a hit to the economy. I think uh, there would clearly be a, a period of uncertainty for at least a few years. That would weigh on mostly business investment, um, but perhaps to some extent as well consumers, although if actually in a, in a recent poll, um, households suggested that they didn't think that a Brexit would leave them any sort of personally, financially less well off. So I think the impact on consumption is perhaps less clear than, than say, business investment. Uh, so, but I think we're looking at slower growth in the immediate aftermath rather than uh, an outright recession, as, as some have warned. So, I mean, there's, the economy is roughly a, a third exports, and about half of those go to, uh, go to the EU. So there's a good chunk of the economy, sort of 85%, that isn't to do with exporting to the EU. And so you know, we don't think that the economy would collapse if we voted to leave. And certainly in that first two-year period, whilst all the existing treaties remain in place, so we still have free trade, free movement of people, um, you know, business is as usual to some extent. Um, and as I say, that, that's a two-year minimum period. It could end up being extended, uh, particularly if the negotiations look as if they might be even more drawn out. So uh, we had a question there. Can we get the mic to that gentleman who I rudely refused to ask his question earlier? Now is your chance. It's actually just picking up on the last point because uh, doesn't the, uh, the impact also depend upon what type of exit we would have from the EU? Yeah. I mean, if, for instance, we uh, had a Norway-type deal, we would still be in the single market. Um, and, it, uh, and my understanding is that the worst kind of scenario would be to go to World Trade Organization rules. So I was just wondering, perhaps you could comment on what difference it would make to your view if we had a Norway type deal yeah. or, or we were completely out? In the first two years, it won't make any difference because we don't leave and all of a sudden revert to a new scenario. We, we remain in the EU for, those, for that negotiation period uh, for the first two years. So that's more to do with what happens after uh, two years. And I think a lot depends on, well, to be honest, a lot, of, a lot of it depends on the domestic political situation as well. So. Um, David Cameron said that he won't resign if, uh, if, if we did vote to leave. Um, some argue that he wouldn't have any choice, but assuming that David Cameron did stay on, then I think we could end up seeing a different situation um, to say if, if Boris Johnson became the new prime minister. So I think if, if Cameron stayed on, then we might see more of a, a Norway type deal, uh, an EEA um, remain, remaining in the, in the single market. And you know, that was the, the East bad scenario in the Treasury's, uh, in the Treasury's analysis. Um, but if David Cameron resigned and perhaps some of the members of Vote Leave became the new Brexit government, then we might see a, a more of a, a hard Brexit, if you like, and, and that if, if no trade deal was negotiated, then as you say, that would be um, uh, going to, to WTO rules. Um, now, clearly, there would be a bigger hit to, to trade under that scenario um, because you would have tariffs as opposed to, to free trade agreements. 
Um, but then again, I think even in that scenario, it, it wouldn't be a complete disaster. You know, the tariff rates have come down significantly over recent decades, so they are fairly low. I think the average tariff on manufactured goods is about 4%. Um, so it would be worse, but not the end of the world. Um, and certainly that type of agreement uh, would allow more flexibility over things like migration, uh, which is still you know, one of the biggest issues, if not the biggest issue for, for a lot of voters. Um, and so I think that the key point is that it's, it, everything's incredibly uncertain. There are many, many different types of relationships that the UK might have um, afterwards. But I think the, the key point is that probably both the, the costs and the benefits of, of EU membership have been overstated. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, and in the long run, the UK would adapt and probably do well. Paul, I've spied with my eyes. There's a gentleman there with a question. Please um, ask your question. Uh, at all, about a French connection. Um, yeah. What would be the biggest concern, a Brexit or Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I will leave David. I'm sure he's keen to ask that one. Yeah. And I, I do want to ask you, actually, John, about the Office Depot view of um, the referendum as well. But let's start with David. Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, should we vote to, uh, to remain on June the 23rd, I, I think people will then focus very much on the risks of Donald Trump. And I think, I think they will regard those risks as quite, quite serious. Um, which is the biggest? Um, well, you can get rid of a, a president after four years. You, if, you, if we vote to leave, I think that's, that will be pretty much permanent. So I, I think that's dangerous. I take a gloomier view on the, uh, both the short and long-term consequences of leaving the uh, EU than, uh, than Paul does. And I think one of the things I would say about the short term is just the political uncertainty. I and mean, Julian mentioned that as a factor. And there would be massive political uncertainty. I don't think David Cameron could survive for very long if we vote to leave. I don't think George Osborne would either. I don't think any of the leave politicians uh, and, you know, I was interested in the vote, which I, I took to be between two and three to one in, in favour of in. It's partly because people are rightly concerned about what comes next. And, you know, you, you mentioned the Norway option. That's already been rejected by the Leave camp because it would imply still paying in to the EU budget to imply free movement of people. Swiss option, similarly, and Swiss are in, uh, having a real debate about immigration at the moment. So it is just this uncertainty, which I think would persist, you know, persist for a very, very long time. And um, it's not just trade deals. It's the, the single market essentially has integrated the UK into the EU economy. Disentangling that, I think, is going to be hugely problematical for business. So I'm not surprised you get a, a vote in favour. I, I would actually, so given that the Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank, has said that Brexit is an economic risk, what I would look, to, look for and what, the question I would ask is with the, would the Federal Reserve list Donald Trump as an economic risk? I just put that out to you. Right, uh, John, um, what, is, is there an official Office Depot view on the referendum? Uh, there isn't. There's, there's big concern. Uh, we spent the last three years becoming a, a European structure instead of country silos. So it would be a lot of disentanglement. Our supply chain is pan-European rather than country-specific, um, etc. So for us, huge implications. Uh, the feeling is that the vote will be to remain. Um, but interestingly, I did a straw poll in the office yesterday and I was outnumbered about eight to one. Um, most people that I spoke to said no, they're going to vote to leave. Um, so I think it depends on the audience, as you said earlier. Um, so I think it is very close. Um, but the Office Depot view is, is concerned if the vote is to leave uh, for a number of reasons. Also, the, the disruption to our, our customers' business, not just in the UK, but the ripple effect across Europe, um, with, with elections coming up, as was mentioned earlier. And, um, Potentially, there's, there's a lot of uh, more unrest, uncertainty, and that slows down investment and, and moving forward, and we're stuck in this, this inertia. Um, so. Was that, yeah, it was a question there from that gentleman there. Uh, Igor Zaks, uh, Tenza. Um, I'm just wondering, what will be your basic assumptions of the policy in UK post-leave, if it will happen, like decisions there, and in EU? 
Like, are we talking about Little Britain or are we talking about the countries that will have a proactive open policy in terms of trade and immigration? So people are saying about score system, about effectively getting a highly qualified workforce and you know, what people are saying about builders, whether the builder is Polish or Chinese, and whether the builder is coming the free movement or under some progressive visa systems that bring in people who are short in supply, may not affect the numbers. The same thing with the trade. If you're looking at EU, uh, there is a deficit there. So gen uh, generally speaking, if uh, uh, there are tariffs or something like it, it, it should have macroeconomic positive uh, impact. And then the trade agreements, we see now a lot of risks to the trade agreements from internal European uh, issues. So, for example, visas with Bulgarians and Romanians, uh, there is a threat to put a veto on transatlantic partnership and uh, the other agreements with US and Canada. So what is the assumption first about what UK is going to do if it's leave? And second, what is the assumption the EU policy will be given that UK is by far not the only countries that have uh, in, in, intention to question their membership or the terms of their membership and, you know, France, many others have some sort of political forces with these views, what is the assumption will be there? So when we compare the risk, can you outline what is the basic assumption for what UK is going to do and for what EU is going to do, not in relationship to each other, but with general policy? Thank you. Uh, David? Yeah, I mean, on, the, uh, um, on those two aspects that you mentioned, I mean, uh, it was, a, it was a, a big and wide-ranging wide question. On um, immigration, uh, the, um, you know, the ambition is to, uh, you know, uh, as you will know, we have a, uh, a permit system, a points-based system for non-EU uh, uh, immigration at the moment. Uh, Non-EU immigra immigration into the UK is larger than EU immigration into the UK, EU net migration into the UK, and always has been. You know, it's, it's, it's larger now. It has been for the last 40-odd years. Um, but there is a system in place. It's not a very effective system. The idea is to introduce a points-based system for uh, EU migration as well. And I think that would just uh, be hugely complex to operate. It would reduce the flexibility of the UK labour market. But that, that is the ambition. Um, on trade... Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the two aspects of it. As you correctly say, we have a trade deficit in goods with the rest of the EU. We have a large trade surplus in services. It is not clear which way those two things will go post-referendum uh, and post-a Brexit vote, if we had a Brexit vote. Because although there will be an incentive, for example, for German car manufacturers to secure a deal to be able to continue to sell into the UK, and for UK car manufacturers, I mean, 80% of our, the cars made in the UK are exported to, to have a similar deal, whether that would be a general trade deal and whether it would cover services is not clear. And it's, uh, so I think, and, and you know, from an EU perspective, they will be torn between the desire to maintain an economic relationship with an important market and the desire not to encourage other countries to go down the same route. So, you know, there will be, to a degree, a kind of, uh, you know, a punishment factor there to not encourage the others. So I think it is going to be very complicated and uncertain in, you know, in, in terms of which way this goes on all those issues. So I'd love to give you a clear and precise answer to your question, but the, it, it is not possible to do so. But those are the kind of thoughts I would have at this stage. Yeah. Uh, and John, I was going to ask you, you talked about the importance of European supply chains and how a vote to leave could disrupt those. What about staff? Um, do you rely on a lot of European immigrants for staffing? Do you rely on that free movement of people? Does, that, does the threat of that worry you for your business? Um, not particularly uh, from that aspect. Um, we, we do have operations throughout Europe. We have a big finance shared service centre in, in Romania um, that serves all of Europe. Um, so I, I don't see that being a, a, a bigger concern for us. Um, I think the biggest concern is the impact on our customers' spend. Um, but also we would need to re-engineer certain aspects of our business uh, where, we, where we do operate on a European basis rather than country silos. So. But I would say our, our bigger concern is, is the impact on, on the European economy, uh, the disruption it would cause, um, and, and the continuation of, of either um, flat growth in, in many areas or very slow growth or potentially a, a decline. 
And what about sort of tariffs on, on the impact of tariffs on prices if we don't have free movement of goods across European borders across into the UK? That is a concern. Um, I mean, our imports are, are, are more, in terms of bulk, it's from, from China. Um, but uh, we do obviously move goods within Europe as well. So that is an area of concern for us. Um, and uh, with, uh, with Ireland, um, we, uh, we store a lot of product in the UK um, for supplying to Southern Ireland. So that's another potential impact if there's a harder border than, than there is presently. So there are lots of concerns that we have. Um, I think until recently, the thought was, well, it, the Remain vote will prevail. I think in the past week, it's, there's a bit more concern that's creeping in. Um, as, as polls suggest, it's a lot closer. Right, it's now 5 to 11. I'm told we need to stop earlier because there are stairs preventing you from getting from your tea, coffee and biscuits. Um, so, uh, I, shall I leave it to you to thank our panel? Uh, Frederick, where's he gone? He was, he was with, with us a minute ago. Here he comes. Right. Shall I leave it to you to thank our panel? Thank you very much. There you go. He thank will. Thank you very much, Louise. Thank you very much to, to all of you for, for this round table. Indeed, uh, we propose a short break. There will be drinks. Uh, at the ground floor and I uh, suggest we all meet up again at 11.30. Thank you very much.